So now we're going to, um, to change, uh, well, location a tiny bit up to the upper airway. And, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome Richard Harvey. Uh, Richard is an ENT surgeon and he's had a particular interest in uh, the relationship between the upper and the lower airways. He's uh, uh, ENT surgeon at St Vincent's. He's also been very actively involved in the Walcott Clinic, um, assessing patients for the relationship between their sleep disordered breathing and uh, the upper airway and its function and dysfunction. And, uh, and I welcome Richard and thank him very much for coming to talk to us about the unified hypothesis of the upper and lower airway. Thank you. So I might have to look on the side here because I'm, I'm running off my laptop and my apologies. And, and the upper airway is often the sort of forgotten part of the whole airway and I really appreciate you inviting me along to talk about it. Uh, my talk is a little bit more uh, uh, lighthearted than the last talk, but it, it, trying to bring together how I view the upper airway. And Christine got it slightly wrong. I, I'm not an ENT surgeon doing um, a, a nose and sinus interest. That's the only thing I do is nose and sinus disorders. So let me take you through my thoughts on the upper airway. There's some disclosures there. I think the first thing that's very important is to acknowledge that all too often, not only general practitioners, but also specialists, we, we simplify the upper airway. We talk about as if rhinitis and sinus disease are the same things. But at least in my world, they're very, very different. And, and as we know with many chronic lung disease and other conditions, as you'll find out, stridor is, and wheeze is not always of lung origins. And we'll find out that there's enormous difference between what happens in the upper airway. And to simplify it, from my mind, if you think of rhinitis, this is really a condition to me where there is vascular congestion, reactive changes, some watery discharge, and it comes from a reaction within the nasal cavity. And you can only ask someone who has severe rhinitis, they can feel handkerchiefs, be terribly blocked, but they don't actually have any sinus disease. And they often have some hallmarks of long-standing changes. They get cobblestone mucosa, some edema, as we'll see later on, of the turbinate heads, and chronic congestion of the nasal airway. Now that's very different from someone who has sinus disease. So when I think of sinus disease, I think of someone who's developed mucosal inflammation primarily, and really mucociliary dysfunction and microbial colonization are secondary events when it comes to sinus disease. So because of the mucosal inflammation, people develop polypoid or hypertrophic changes in their sinus cavity. And secondarily to that, for the majority of patients who don't have immunodeficiencies, uh, they develop microbial colonization, often in waves and at different times of the year. So rhinitis and sinus disease are not the same thing. And I still see a, a trend in GP land that they're often bundled together or even mentioned together. And I, and I think if we're not even separating the two of them, it becomes very challenging to direct treatments appropriately. What, how do I differentiate the two before we move on to actually talk about the interaction between rhinitis, sinus disease and the lower airway? Well, we use radiology, of course. We use endoscopy because in rhinitis, um, it nose doesn't look normal like this. It often looks congested, vasodilated. And we use the history. So people have rhinitis, in my mind, as there is many finesse aspects to assessing someone's lower airway. They have itch, sneeze, rhinorrhea, conjunctival, sometimes skin involvement. And they almost always have a relationship with childhood asthma when it's just simple um, uh, allergic rhinitis. As opposed to someone with sinus disease, their radiology is different. They don't have this lovely appearance to their middle meatus. They often have polypoid changes and eosinophilic-like mucin coming from that area. And they give a different story. They will often complain of nasal congestion and pressure and they get smell loss very early on in the piece, as opposed to someone with terrible allergy. They get infective episodes and flare-ups, but the other thing is that for many of these patients, it's an adult onset disease. Severe eosinophilic airway inflammation that affects both lower and upper is not something that is characterised in early life. It's something that really comes on in 30s and 40s. And we use clinical history, endoscopy and radiology, and I really think that People in this room are the, are the group that really need to embrace upper airway endoscopy as much as you do uh, bronchoscopy. You know, I think for, unfortunately, many respiratory physicians, the nose is just something annoying that you have to get through to get into the larynx and the trachea, and you hope to not make it bleed on the way. Um, let's talk then about 
the unified airway. These are the sort of three theories that have been touted around even since I was a trainee. The concept of nasal bronchial reflex. I think there's now some evidence that in people who lose trigeminal nerve activity in animals, that, that there is a reflex that exists. But it, it, it's fair to say it's short-lived and it really doesn't explain the chronicity of interactions that we see between the upper and lower airway. The concept of sinonasal protection of the airway, once again, I think that's, that's a phenomenon. This is the idea that you, know, you lose your warming and humidification of your air, your mouth breathing, and therefore your lower airway is bad. While I just still believe that probably does contribute to some people's decline, there are many examples of people who are tracheostomized, uh, have no upper airway function, and they don't develop inflammatory airways disease, nor do they have actually even significant reactions. So, I think while they may be features, they really once again don't explain the complexity of interaction we see between the upper and lower airway. But it is this last one, the concept that there is a shared inflammation across to a whole unified airway, which I think has the most evidence for it. It's not surprising, because if you look at sinus and sputum eosinophilia, they're closely related. There's studies to show that sputum eosinophilia can predict CRS severity, so there's studies on that. And likewise, we endotype all our patients into sort of eosinophilic groups, and there's certainly very good relationships between degrees of nasal eosinophilia, e either as eosinophilic mucin on lavage or eosinophilic biopsies, that show there's a relationship there with low airway disease. And you can, there's even studies where they've correlated the degree of bronchodilator response with the degree of nasal eosinophilia. So we know that perhaps what happens in the upper airway is literally just a window to what's happening across the entire airspace. So I think in 2016, to modify a talk, I think when it comes to considering the unified airway, I think who doesn't in 2016 think that the airway acts as a whole organ? And I think the artificial separation is unfortunately a Western medicine thing. And this is the concept of the unified airway. And I guess there's teleologic sense here. If you take a biopsy of the sinus cavity in the lungs, it looks the same. It's just respiratory epithelium. It's exposed to the same environment. It probably has the same environmental injurious agents that affect someone over their lifetime, virus exposure, pollution exposure. So there are those epithelial similarities, but there are some differences because there are structural differences between the upper and lower airway. In the upper airway, it's a vascular bed that makes up the submucosa and predominantly, and in the, and in the lower airway, it's more about muscle. And there is a difference in the framework. The upper airway is in a bony, fixed confines where the lung has the dynamic, perhaps cartilaginous space that it lives in. And that influences then the challenges we see. When you perform a challenge on the lower airway, you get bronchospasm and other changes. That's because of the nature of what's happening underneath. And when we do a challenge, we see congestion and watery discharge, vascular leakage, and that really reflects merely the underlying components. And for many of our patients, they can tell the two interact. They get, they get a flare up at their nose and they start to produce mucus and then their lungs go off. And I know that for many respiratory physicians, it always seems like the sinuses cause the lung disease. But I can tell you right now, as much as my clinic, there's many people say, I can tell I'm getting bad or I'm about to get congested because I start to get wheezy. And so it goes in reverse. And for, it's sort of like Escher's diagrams. What, what is the chicken and the egg here? It's not, they probably work in concert just reflecting common inflammation across a common space. Where does that data come from though? It's, it's not just clinical. So I love these studies. This is, I, I assume everyone in this room probably knows this study, but if you don't or for trainees who've never read it, this is the Brunstall studies where they, they did segmental bronchial provocation. So they, they dropped antigen into a segment bronchus with a bronchoscope. And then they actually measured IL-5 in the nose 24 hours later. And this shows that not only IL-5 was increased, but BMK or eosinophil populations were increased in the nose. And there was actually a serum, uh, one more, there's, there's BMK in the nose. And click once more, there you go. And even eosinophils in the blood increased. That's really, it's one of those studies you do struggle getting through ethics today take patients doing a bronchoscopy on them, dropping some antigen into them. But it was a really a terrific study, and one of my colleagues, Witzke Fockens, who is a rhinologist in, in Netherlands, oversaw that study, and it showed that unique interaction between the upper and lower airway. It's not to say that it's the cause of the disease. 
but it shows you that when you create inflammation in one compartment of the airway, you can certainly, some of the mediators will drive inflammation across the whole airspace. And it's been done in reverse. Now, of course, in reverse, when you segmentally drop something in the nose, you know, the criticism of that study when it was done as the second study, because they intentionally didn't do it as the first study, is that you could imagine that somehow the patient aspirated or swallowed, that somehow they contaminated their lower airway, and therefore maybe it's not methodologically quite as tight as the first one. Um, but similar story, drop say, irritation within the nose space, and then bronchoscopy and biopsy of the lung to show that similar changes occurred um, in the actual airway. So we have a situation here where we have the upper airway. When it gets some sort of pro-inflammatory trigger, whether there is or isn't chronic disease there, you get a response and then you get interaction where it makes the lower airway worse. And the same thing happens in reverse. You get a pro-inflammatory trigger and you get that response. There is both systemic mediators that can be identified in another compartment in the airway and the whole thing goes round and round. So we often do see this cycle to some degree. Where do I feel that I see this clinically? So here's a patient who's come and see me. This patient has the ABPA equivalent of the upper airway. This is AFS. Now AFS is unique because it's not like diffuse nasal polyps and eosinophilic disease of the upper airway. It's really a compartmentalized disease. But many of these patients, like this patient here, this lady in particular, she went and saw many people because she got very wheezy and she got cough, but everything was normal in a lower airway. But she had this very significant eosinophilic inflammatory response. And, and I believe in AFS as a unique condition, it's not just part of polyps, um, where she's got an inflammatory source. And when we do surgery, surgery for ENT surgery has changed. It's not a plumbing or ventilation problem. This is a problem where a patient has an inflammatory inflammation of a cavity. Now, admittedly, in this place, probably also fungal um, material sitting around. Our surgery is, is not designed to unblock or ventilate. It's designed to create a simple sinus cavity that this patient can use a corticosteroid irrigation and settle this condition down. And when we do that, it's quite amazing. The lower airway settles down as well. And you say, what? A couple of respiratory physicians who've said to me, what did you do to the patient you know, all this time? I said, I gave you this, you know, when it came to actually what I did in the airway. Now, that's a unique condition where we've got a, a unique source of inflammation in one part of the airway, and you see this interaction occurring. And I think you see this anecdotally. So for chronic disease, in particular, things that are chronic and diffuse, the idea that we compartmentalise the airway off, you've got somehow polyps in the upper airway or adult onset asthma. If you've got polyps in your nose, you have asthma to some degree. You have eosinophilic asthma to some degree. You just maybe, maybe it's not clinically relevant enough, but it, it's there to some degree. So when I think of endotypes, this is really important for me because we see these different endotypes in the upper airway. Now, I've forgotten I haven't put the reference here, but there's obviously a lot of you know, data coming out. We, too, in the upper airway try to endotype our disease. But I think there's a correlation here that we see in the upper airway. So this is the first group I want to show you here. This is the childhood sort of classic allergic asthma, allergic rhinitis. And, and to me, this is what I see as an interaction between upper and lower airway. You will see, in my opinion, patients who get nasal congestion, discharge, they get really bad flare-ups in their nose, but they almost always, when it's allergic, they usually have childhood, young adult asthma and rhinitis. These things go together. Now, I think you could make a case here that this is just common inhalant allergen exposure across the whole airway. Perhaps not more complicated than that. Now, for those of you who see these patients, you know that they often have completely normal sinus. It's not a sinus disease, no matter how bitterly they complain of their nose, because their nose often looks like this. This is the same person. This person is very congested, even some smell loss starting to creep in with someone who's developed this sort of hypertrophic change. A real problem for the patient, but it's not a sinus disease, it's an allergic rhinitis in these patients. Now, I'm a big promoter of doing endoscopy, and I'd love you to think of the upper airway as not just a place that you need to get through to get to somewhere else, but if you have an endoscope in the rooms, there's a lot more that can be seen now with high definition cameras. And this is just, I want to touch on a study we did recently, what we presented. There are changes in the upper airway, subtle things that you can see that can give you great markers for what's going on. And one of them is edema of the middle turbinate head. So if you look at the middle turbinate, it often looks normal. Now, we'll skip to this one. See this jelly-like change here and diffuse swelling? I think most people can make that out. 
a bit of subtler here maybe, and there's like a little focus of edema here. But if you actually take those minor edematous changes within the nose and look at them, they actually correlate very, very well to inhalant allergy. So this is just looking at the positive predictive value of diffuse and polypoid edema. They're very, very high. The likelihood ratios are excellent. They're not very sensitive. So sensitivity is pretty poor. But when they're present and you see them, the positive predictive value is very, very high. And I think down the track, we're going to develop imaging techniques that will allow you to look in a nose and irrelevant of what their epicutaneous or serum testing says, you'll be able to have a good idea about whether or not they have edema. And this is another example. So this is the typical patient sent to me with polyps. But this person doesn't have polyps. This person's got a severe allergic rhinitis. And this is just edema coming from the head of the middle turbinate. And for anyone else, you might think that it's some sort of polypoid disease, but it's not. This is another example, almost like a polyp in the nose, but normal sinuses. And you see this in inhalant allergy. And I think understanding that this is what's going on in some people is, is very, very important. Let's talk about a big group. If you said to half my practice, probably my mortgage is paid off by managing these patients here. This is the adult onset eosinophilic asthma severe nasal polyposis group. Now, it's commonly eosinophilic. We understand there's probably other types for it, but in Australia, it's probably more a locally driven innate lymphoid cell eosinophilia. It's not a systemic condition. It's usually located to the airway. And whether or not uh, you're a, a mucosal barrier believer or a microflora believer, the, these are sort of theories of research. But essentially, it, it's the idea that it's still a local phenomenon. Most people who get adult onset disease don't have eosinophilic disease elsewhere in their body. It's an airway problem. And these are the patients that we see. Classically, very diffuse sinus inflammation, hypertrophic changes. And this is what their middle meatus looks like. They get, they get terrible infective complications secondary, but lots of flare-ups and the sort of clinical presentation we discussed before. And I can't stress enough that rhinology and upper airway specialists have evolved significantly. We don't treat these patients as people who have plumbing or blockage problems. They have an inflammatory disorder. You give them steroid, they love it for many of them, as you guys know as well in the lower airway. And it's all about having eosinophilic disease up here, over here, or up in here, that they really have no way of managing apart from taking corticosteroids systemically. And so a lot of our treatment to break that cycle is to give them a sinus cavity they can topicalize. It's a very different from simple sinus surgery. And we end up with a sort of a cavity that they then use a corticosteroid solution. And it's a, it's a little bit harder than using a spacer or a dry powder inhaler to get the, de the medication there. But I, I'm no ignorant. I know that the lower airway is also a challenging place to get drug delivery to. It's not, not as straightforward, but the upper airway is even harder. And you can see when we've surgically modified the airway, you can see at all the places we have to get local drug. It's very challenging. Bony framework, it's like a honeycomb. If you're really going to get local drug delivery into the entire upper airway space, it, it really requires a very unique um, and different set of care. And it moves us away. So for those of you who've grown up with patients who've had five, six, seven polypectomies, taking polyps out is not really in the vocabulary of, of sinus surgeons anymore. Now, it's no doubt that, sure, the patient's going to feel nice for having that out. And yeah, it keeps on going. Um, but it's more about, um, can we hit the other picture, do you mind? It's more about, um, this is not going to play. You've seen it. Creating the sinus cavity that they can then topicalize. That's, that's, what, that's what we do. And it's very rare. Our take back for doing revision polypic mouse is, is less than 5%. For most patients, we're able to give them a cavity they can manage. Just move me on, thanks very much. And I think this is true. As an upper airway surgeon looking after inflammatory airway disease, if pregnancy didn't have side effects, I wouldn't have a job as a surgeon in these patients. I think that's very true. Now, last one here, just my last few minutes. Oh, my apologies, we should go on. One more thing. I think everyone here is educated, but you know, not all our colleagues are. If your idea of upper airway disease you know, is all about infection and obstruction. You probably think Madonna still looks like this. And that was really in the 1980s. You know, 
Then came in the 1990s, you know, we understood, okay, nasal polyps are part of something different. You know, you probably thought Madonna looked like this and was, was married to some English film director. But really, for upper airway specialists like myself, you know, we understand that inflammatory disease really accounts for a lot. It's not infection. Antibiotics rarely form the part of my management, nor do simple nasal sprays. And I understand that Donna, she still looks good, but she looks a bit more like this. You know, and if you're up to date, you might think she's still dating a baseball player. And if you're really up to date, you know that's over as well. <laughs> now, last one of all, I want to talk about LPR. So I'm touching this, and this might be a bit of a transition into Daniel's space, because we see people who continually present with lung disease, upper airway symptoms, but their problem is not inflammation of the airway. Even if they minor changes, it's this. I have to show a couple of videos because once again, I know in a flexible, you often don't see this, but this is a normal larynx. There's a normal larynx here. Nice thin vocal cot folds. The epiglottis, or the subglottis is very thin. And I'm sure Daniel's you know, far more uh, FA at, at talking to us about this. But we see patients then who don't look like this. They get subtly bad and they start to complain of mucus at the back of their throat and cough. And they have a little bit of edema in their subglottis. And maybe that's a subtle one. But then, then you get a group that then have voice loss and it becomes a bit clearer. So when you come down here, their vocal folds don't look the same anymore. It's a bit more obvious. It's like the middle turbinate head edema, you know, there's subtle changes that we didn't appreciate before. And then you get the patient who comes and sees me because they've had a sinus operation, they've got some minor thickening in their airway and they think they've got sinus disease and their airway looks like this. And I think their upper airway looks normal, but they feel that there's mucus there and they're clearing mucus at the back of their throat. It's my sinuses, it has to be my sinuses. But this is what their larynx looks like. And we actually perform studies, so this is someone with severe reflux, and we, we do studies where we do a Bravo test, which is sort of measuring the pH with a small probe. I mean, there are more probably validated ways of doing it, but this is a patient-friendly way where they have a little probe that sits in there and they wear a, a belt and they, um, it's not the same as uh, wearing a tube coming out of your nose. And so this is how we define reflux events in patients in which laryngopharyngeal reflux is really contributing to their cough, their throat clearing, their mucus, their postnasal drip. And, and they, in a world, they, they overlap. You know, we see patients have a bit of both. And, and a time comes when you can maybe, you've optimised their, their airway condition, they might have both. I mean, asthma, how, how common is asthma? Is that 9% of the population in Australia? So you will have a group of people who have both. So in conclusion, inflammatory disease for me is accounts really for the vast majority of patients who have chronic upper airway disease. And in childhood, you know, I really believe it's an inhalant allergy driven, somewhere between patients who have rhinitis and, and um, asthma, allergic asthma. But of course in adults, it's a different phenomenon. It's, it's an eosinophilic inflammatory disease for many patients. Upper airway disease has shifted. The way we manage things has changed from 20 years ago. And this is my last thing, is that we all need to get on board as lower airway and upper airway doctors. You know, um, the concept that neurologically intact patients aspirate their secretions and that's the cause of their lower airway disease really doesn't have good evidence base. And I certainly don't sit down with my patients and tell you, I've got, your respiratory doctor has to get your disease under control because you're coughing secretions up into your nose and that's why it's bad. <laughs> So I think, I think the evidence there has suggested that, that there is a shared inflammation. We're probably talking about a common disease, and I think there's a lot of similarities. Thank you very much.